and the drive through rolls on, and we are here, and it's another day, and we don't know what we're going to do, but we have to talk about something that answered the age-old question, what is the exact opposite of Great American Bash 89? A <laughs> double or nothing, 2023. How about desperation or nothing? May, is that because that's what it, it reeked of, it dripped of, it oozed of. Everybody was so desperate in their own Markish way, from Tony the Mark Booker to the Mark Roster to the Mark production staff and et cetera, et cetera, to the Mark that puts together all the barbed wire gimmicks. They were so determined to go out there and despite what they were working with, try to have the greatest show of all time that uh, what I, I tweeted about it. I said, I have never until last night seen a multiple car pile up on the interstate that took four hours from the first brake pump to the last skid mark was laid down. You didn't see the pre-show? I did not see the pre-show. You could extend that time a little bit. Jeff Hardy <laughs> oh, God. in the Hardy Party match. Hardy Party. When he slipped off the rope right after he missed his own move, that was truly something, and it was really, it was sad to see, and he shouldn't be in there, and he shouldn't have been brought back, but whatever. Well, there is a number of sad things. It was sad that, I know Tony got a kick out of having Sabu out there. I don't know, did we see his face? Yeah, we did saw we his face see? at one point, but then we saw him just kind of walk out. Yes, and they were gone, and then, and, and Arn. I was I was so embarrassed for him that he had to be a part of all of this. This may lay claim to the saddest pay-per-view event of all time. There was a lot of sadness to go around. And that's why, so is it desperation or nothing? Because the people in Las Vegas, they they got interested at certain points, either when something was really even for this event, unexpected or potentially funny, or every once in a while, they were actually really interested. But there was a lot of sitting around. And again, it's just chaos. It got so... They have, they have a main event amongst their alleged top guys that they, by the very nature of it, the rules of it, or lack thereof, if you will, is going to go all over the building. It's going to be eight guys and crazy wild and blood or whatever. So what do they do? They have six other fucking matches before that where there's crazy wild and blood and all over the building or outside in the fucking street or in the goddamn septic tank. But it just blended together like a, Everybody's trying hard. They just don't know what they're doing. They're making good time, but they're hopelessly lost. And I mean, from to start this night of disaster and mayhem with a 21 man battle royal, with all the fucking jobbers and or people that nobody gives a shit about that you didn't even fucking bother to spend time on this four-hour extravaganza to even introduce the motherfuckers. The show opens up, there's 20 guys on the floor, and here comes Pockets. And of course, it's for the Dollar General Store title that Tony has bought for his favorite action figure. And it just it just went on and on and on. Brian, have you ever seen a 25-minute battle royal, not the Royal Rumble, just a battle royal with fucking 21 job guys go on and on and on? No, but to be fair, there are a lot of matches on this show that just went on and on and on. It was a <laughs> series of endless matches, including this battle royal, which wasn't very good to me. Someone did ask her in a press scrum afterwards. They said that may have been one of the greatest battle royals of all time. <laughs> There's a real disconnect right now between fans in the bubble and fans in reality. Yeah, this match was Jesus not good. Christ. And and then everybody started on the floor, as I mentioned, and the dipshit with the play belt gets the ring and then here comes everybody. But you only are officially in the match when you get in the ring. So everybody that was fighting on the floor 
wasn't in the match yet unless they'd gotten in the ring so that that's so that they could do all the things where they jump off of shit and technically would be eliminating themselves. But why have any rules since there are none anywhere else? And the battle Royals apparently now are no DQ lazy booking. Um, and uh, so then a bunch of people fight on the floor and don't get in and do dives and then they get in, but then they're dumped out and, but why would doing a dive help you win this thing anyway? How in the world is that going to help in any way? Because it gets the crowd to pop. Uh, so guess who won the pony? Pockets. Of course, the mascot. Did you see Commander? Him. Did you fast forward or stop the fast forward enough to see Commander do the fucking move where he runs over the ropes and I, dives I like, to the floor? Yeah. yeah. And the Battle Royal? Yes. The one yeah. movie has that we keep seeing over and over takes him <laughs> 30 seconds to catch his breath and get his balance and everyone waits for him to run and then he runs and he jumps. He says a small prayer first. <laughs> but I mean, so it, I did fast forward mo most of this because what the fuck, it just went on and on and on again. And the beat don't stop until the break of dawn. And Pockets won 25 minutes into the program. So then... I know, Brian, I know people are not going to believe this, but they followed up a match where anything goes with another match where anything goes. But this time it wasn't sanctioned. So Tony and his father and Megan and all of the officials can't get sued if anything bad happens, to, except for the fans. Something bad happened to the fans. They got the stink bored out of them. Can I say something before you review this match? Please do. This was one of the worst matches I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> and I mean it. I'm not being, I'm not just saying that. This was one of the worst matches I've ever seen in my life. And I mean, now that's only slightly hyperbolic because we have seen videotape of, you know, untrained goofballs on a show at a basement somewhere in front of six people that technically you could probably say it was a worse match, but I don't think I've ever seen this, anything as bad in front of people, uh, the real people, serious people, broadcast. Um, the fans went silent. They were like, what, what are we supposed no, they, to do? They, <laughs> I know it was like they were in suspended animation. It was like, what the fuck is going on in front of us? And there was, it, there was, they were just staring. I mean, again, they were sending people around with mirrors to hold them in front of fucking fans' faces to see if they were still breathing. It was so awkwardly quiet that at one point I couldn't tell. I'm like, does Adam Cole always move like this and I've never noticed it? Or is it because the fans are so silent? It seems like he's taking extra steps and doing things he doesn't need to do. There was so much silence, it kind of impeded upon everything in the match. And I noted, by the way, Jim Ross was on color. I forgot that he worked there. But he was back, and and he was reasonably listenable, unlike the normal commentary, for a few matches. And then suddenly I noticed he was gone, and we never heard from him again. For the most part, I found Jim Ross enjoyable. It was a relief to see him come out there. The commentary is awful. Excalibur was excruciatingly awful on this entire broadcast. It was painful. It was so bad. But Jim Ross, the problem is, when you tell people that this is the best Chris Jericho's ever been, when you say this match is guaranteed to be a classic. Yeah. You know, that's the only thing I don't like. I like Jim Ross. Everything he says, except don't build up shit that makes you look like a liar. Well, he, they did prove him wrong in that instance. Um, so it's an unsanctioned match. Anything goes lazy booking Adam Cole versus Chris Jericho. Cole has Roderick strong and Sabu in his corner. And Jericho <laughs> has the allegedly, no, that, I'm sorry, I gotta stop you. At one point, the best line was Jim Ross during the match, and he was kind of ignored by the other commentators. He says, isn't Sabu the referee? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he mixed anything. He meant Mark Briscoe was gonna be the referee later on, but Sabu was, yes, was... Special enforcer. What is uh, that? I don't know. And then nobody else knew either. Jericho had the four stooges, everybody that's not Sammy Guevara and his little group of idolaters or appreciators or whatever they are. Idolaters. And as soon as they all got down there, they all started fighting. 
the seconds too. Everybody was just just broke out in a fight. And the Stooges got on Adam Cole, and then Jericho and Sabu got in the ring and stood there with the chairs forever. And then did the fencing with the chairs. And then Jericho dropped his chair and he got bumped out, and Sabu climbed up to the top and more or less just fell off the top rope out onto the floor and put one of the heels through a table who was conveniently laying there waiting for it. So Tony Khan was back there loving it. And it's Sabu's had multiple health issues. He's in his fifties. He's nearly died. He's had injury after injury. Just to relive a moment of your childhood. I mean, seriously, if, <clears throat> when I brought Jackie Fargo to the Louisville gardens, when he was a little bit older than Sabu and probably in much better shape, I didn't ask him to take any bumps through furniture because he did it 30 years before, right? I, what if he asked you if he could do it? He wouldn't have. <laughs> That's one thing he would have not asked. Hey, can I take a bump? Are you out of your... He didn't ask that when he was in the business. <laughs> so anyway so the guys that were supposed to be in this match fighting are not fighting at this point but then somehow brian you know what they did all of them everybody all of the sabu the the <laughs> special star and all of the seconds and everybody that were having this giant donny brook they just fought off and they were gone and then Jericho and Cole start this match, and immediately they go out to the floor. And they weren't having a wrestling match or a fight. They were just doing slow-paced garbage wrestling on the outside, wouldn't get in the ring. And the fans were just sitting there and staring. And then they got in the ring, and I made note that Jericho is wearing brand-new designer concrete boots. It's like they were in fucking jelly. And then at one point, he got the walls of Jericho and Adam eventually, after teasing it and you knowing it was coming and him having a camera shot of it for ages and the announcers talking about it, he did the fire extinguisher spot. But he had already, he, he, it was there, it was in the shot. He waited, then he pulled it in, and everybody saw it. He waited, waited, and it finally shot. And it was so awkward just the way he was hanging out, too. I mean, Jericho was, like, on an angle, and he was yeah. sitting like on the ro the rope was involved, and Cole was all the way out of the ring. Yeah, and then he had to, he pulled him in, and Jericho had to turn around and look to the right so he could hit him in the face with the spray. Um, And then he picked it up and hit Jericho with it, but you can't work with a fire extinguisher. Not one that size. So it looked like shit. And then suddenly Jericho gets a kendo stick. But here comes Britt Baker and gets in the ring and wears him out with the kendo stick. Just beats a bejesus out of him. And then here comes Soraya and beats Britt Baker up. And then they get in the, and then they fought off. And you didn't see them anymore. And then more nothing happened where they were just laying around breathing. And then Adam Cole gets up on the top rope and Jericho chucks the chair at him and it hits him and he falls off the top rope through another table out on the floor. Adam Cole has just returned from almost a year out injured with concussions. And in the worst match in recorded history. He's taking a chair to the head and falling through a table off the top rope. And everything was in slow motion and everything was telegraphed. It was such a bad match. And I wrote, nobody cares about any of this, but they're leaving nothing for anyone else later either. So it's a double whammy. And then they got a chain out, a 20-foot chain with cuffs on either end of it. And Jericho cuffed one end on Adam Cole. But Adam Cole fought back and put the other end on Jericho, and now it was a chain match. And then Cole botched a Panama Sunrise. Well, I don't know who botches a Panama Sunrise, because it really doesn't make any sense anyway. The Canadian destroyer off the thing, 
Is it the flipper or the flippy? You can't tell who that is anyway. But point being, instead of going all the way over, they kind of just did a fucking back bump wham one guy on top of the other guy. I believe that's where Jericho got his eye split open. Or at least it, it I didn't ever see any blood, but it was it was red at the end and it was black later. So he got probably one of the links of the chain to the face smashed by a body on top of him because they're trying to fucking do backflips over each other when they're tied up with a fucking logging chain and one of the participants is a fucking 53-year-old man. Is it 55 or 52 you can get AARP? I have no idea. I got it, but I can't remember because it's been so long ago. But... If it's 52, I'm calling him AAR Jericho. Anyway, so at that point, that's when referee Aubrey Ed pulled out the black gloves and put them on her front hooves because we did have some kind of blood in there somewhere. But anyway, so Jericho whips Cole with the chain, but that, of course, looked phony and fake too because it's too heavy to work with and you can't do it believably at least not in the way they were doing it i could have given them a few suggestions but i wasn't even there so then uh, uh, the finish came when cole got on jericho where he hit a knee with the chain wrapped around his knee and then he got on Jericho and he was doing fake punches with the chain because you can't, again, the chain is way too big and too heavy to work with it believably. And also, if you did hit somebody hard, it would break your fucking fingers because it's too big and heavy. But then he switched hands and had to throw barehanded punches with the left hand because Jericho hadn't thought ahead and handcuffed Cole's right arm. So Cole couldn't fucking throw regular punches with the right hand without bringing the chain down on top of Jericho, who's already been fucking potated with it anyway. So he throws fake punches with the left hand to the top of Jericho's head or wherever the fuck in the vicinity of Jericho. And then Aubrey just stops it. She says, nay! Nay, no more. And the crowd booed because it looked so bad. The crowd booed the baby face beating the heel into submission until the referee stopped it. Have you ever heard that before? They were, they, they were booing the fucking shitty looking finish. They were waiting for anything to like about this match and it never came. And then this finish was one of the all time bad finishes. And it certainly didn't make anyone happy, and the fans let them. That woke the fans up. <laughs> I, I, I mean, my God, and this also went so long. It was an hour into the show, these first two events, the Battle Royal and, and this, but it just it cut, it cut half the time, cut all of the outside bullshit. And keep up a bit of a pace. And goddamn, just have a. I mean, they didn't channel Tully Blanchard and Magnum TA. They channeled fucking Ian Rotten and Dipshit McGee. Just the worst about the worst things about bad indie garbage wrestling. And their smoke and mirrors made no sense with the, the multiple man fight at the beginning and the fucking girls running in at least later on, Jeff Jarrett's smoke and mirrors made some sense. Still was a little overdone, but this was it, it. People were at some points actually interested. Whereas this was an ex if anybody wanted to go to the concession stand or take a piss or whatever, they would have been happy to have this match. Otherwise, I can't imagine this thrilled anybody in that building. This was one of the worst matches ever. Chris Jericho looked awful in this. Adam Cole. And I feel bad saying this kind of thing because everyone 
tells me he's the nicest guy ever. He is. He is. But he's too skinny to be a wrestler. It's not even skinny. He looks frail. At one point when Jericho had him in the Boston Crab and you could see his midsection, like his shirt was like halfway, you see how skinny he is. And I'm sorry, you could hit as many super kicks as you want. More than anyone you can name on that roster, the Young Bucks, Orange Cassidy, whoever you want to name. I don't believe he could beat anybody. It's ridiculous, and I don't think this is something that's going to get better as he gets older, because he's not, he doesn't look, he never looked imposing, but he doesn't look in as good a shape as he did a few years he ago. He looked athletic. He looked at that the size was the, his drawback. He can talk, he can work, he can do things. He's a very intelligent kid. But he looked he looked somehow conditioned. And I and the only reason cuz I know how he's a great guy and I know how determined he was to get better in the wrestling business when I worked with him years ago. And I I can't I, I, I hesitate to actually come out and blister him because I've got to think it's got to be something to do with his health because elsewise he wouldn't have just completely given up, tan, drink milkshakes, go to the gym, and, you know, whatever the fuck. I'm not, he's never going to look like Luger. No, but Jericho's not. A little not... weight and a little tone and a little tan. Jericho's not the biggest guy in the world and he looked twice the size of Cole. Like Dick the Bruiser. Yeah. And, you know, I'm watching this match, and I'm watching him go toe-to-toe, -to -toe and it just doesn't seem in any way believable. And this feud hasn't done anyone any favors. He comes, Adam Cole comes out of it looking awful because the Britt Baker angle was really poorly done. And everything else in this hasn't been good, and then it had the worst match of all time here. Hopefully this is the end of them working together. Well, no! You didn't hear later on? Oh, no, they have the mixed match on Dynamite. We get yes, more. Yes, and, and to contradict every rule of logic and law of gravity in the history of the wrestling business, they did an angle on a pay-per-view to come back with the match on free TV. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know what? I got to say, though, it's, I, I forget when it was. You'll go through the matches and I'll realize it, but at one point during the show, it hit me. Like, this doesn't even feel like an AEW pay-per-view. Like, there have been pay-per-views where there have been matches I really liked. There have been pay-per-views of matches I didn't like, but they felt like a big deal. This felt like a super-sized Dynamite or Rampage. No, you know what this was? This was an independent show with a promoter that just won the lottery and he started a company and, and he, he, we've seen him before over the last 30, there were the heroes of wrestling pay-per-view from where was it? Bay St. Louis or whatever, where they get enough money to put on a big show and they hire some names, but it's still garbage indie wrestling and nobody knows what the fuck they're doing. And some of the people that might don't care because they're getting paid. That's what it looked like. Except this is going on and on and on. And, uh, but yeah, it, uh, it, for the people who don't know what we were referring to a minute ago, later on, Jericho and Soraya do a promo and challenge Adam and Britt to a mixed tag team match on Dynamite this coming Wednesday. So, as I said, for the first time ever in the history of fucking wrestling, they did an angle on a pay-per-view to lead to a gimmick match on free television instead of the other way around. And, honestly, the mixed tag would probably have had more interest and drawn more revenue, whether it be tickets or pay-per-view buys or whatever the case, than this fucking fiasco they had on the pay-per-view because it was an anything-goes match in a company full of anything-goes matches. Jericho and Cole were not going to do anything different, even if this was good. It still would have been different. But having Britt and Soraya partners with Cole and Jericho might tickle a few people's taints just because it's a little bit more different. So they're going to give that one away on TV. <sighs> All righty then.
The AEW Tag Team Championship was on the line next with FTR against Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal with Mark Briscoe as referee. And I'm going to say, was this the only match on the show that actually had was the legitimate rules of wrestling. You could be disqualified. You could be counted out. You know, pinfallers. Of, I mean, just, and people couldn't just do shit right in front of the referee. Supposedly, <laughs> is this the only, <laughs> I mean, there were more idiots running around ringside during this match than any other thing on the show. And one of the referees well, took a guitar shot. Well, yes, but at least that way he didn't see what happened afterwards. <laughs> it was a she. she. No, that's right. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> um, but allegedly, this match was going to be a tag team match for the title. There wasn't any no DQ rule. It wasn't unsanctioned. It wasn't, and and technically they didn't violate any of the rules because the referees were always unconscious at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so th I, this was a mixed bag. Dax and Jay started, and it was the first time in the show that it looked like pro wrestlers were in the ring, and I wasn't ashamed of watching it. But at the same time, they were wrestling after two long garbage matches that have had everything in the world already done in them. So what are these guys hand-to-hand -hand supposed to do? Uh, you know... <sighs> And that's why I wrote Tony can't build a show either, either that or this is an inverted pyramid. Um, you think they should have started the show with this? Uh, probably it would have got people in a good fucking mood. It would have got people in a good mood because they had ups and downs. The people did get into this at the end. There were more reactions in the finish to this that again, an issue that nobody cared about. But there were more reactions in the finish than there were in that goddamn Falls Count Anywhere fiasco, or not Falls, but unsanctioned, whatever the fuck it was. Contractually signed, unsanctioned Con match. Contractually unsigned, unsanctioned, whatever. Because at least it was shit that gets reaction from people visually, or twists and turns, shit that you might not expect, or, oh, she got it in the face with the pie anywhere, whatever. But we were getting ahead of ourselves. That's the thing is that these guys are professionals. They know how to work, but nobody cared about the issue because the issue has been so stupid. And they still had Sanjay and Zippy and Karen now at ringside. And Mark is the rep. Briscoe's the referee. FTR's homage to the Midnight Express was the double cross body on Jay Lethal and Jeff off the top from the Southern Boys Midnight Express Great American Bash match. Um, Jeff pulled the top rope on cash when he was hitting it. He took a real nice bump over the top and they had a heat spot and said this, I like this match because there was a clear baby face team and a clear heel team. And they didn't just do moves back and forth to each other for no reason. They followed a, a logical progression. The baby faces shined mostly. Then they cut the fucking baby face off for a hit with a heat spot. And they get on him, but it, I wrote it was like a wrestling show at a funeral. Because people, the people didn't care when the other guys in the previous match did all that shit. Why are they going to care when two guys presented as lesser stars, or four guys presented as lesser stars are doing hand-to-hand -hand combat? They've shot themselves in the foot. It, the promotion has with uh, doing these matches in these orders. Anyway, decent tag match. Nobody cared. Long heat on cash. And Dax hit a nice brain buster. No reaction. Crowds on life support. Some more shit happened. Uh, they did a nice doomsday device. But on the cover, Sanjay pulled Dax out on the floor and Mark kicked Sanjay out of ringside and Zippy with him. And that was the first response they really got in the match. And this is where Jeff Jarrett's David Copperfield act kicks in. And he got the reaction, but Jesus Christ, on, on this show, these, these used to be great finishes when they were in the main event, not on the card in a sea of chaos, but they got to people because it was put together right. Fucking 
Boom, the heels get kicked out of ringside. Jeff swings a fucking guitar. But Dax ducks and Jeff hits Mark and knocks him out. Now FTR hit their finish on Jay, but there's no referee. Here comes referee Aubrey. And Sanjay gets in her way. And here comes Karen and hits Aubrey over the head with a guitar. And by the way, Karen didn't have the exact reach on that. She's not as experienced with the guitar swing. And so she hit old Aubrey Ed. Holy mackerel. Right with the the end of the frame end of the guitar. Instead of safely over the top with the fucking hollow part, the, the end of it cracked her. So I bet she'll have trouble wearing her blinders for a couple of weeks. Did you see how she sold it? She had her both hands go up in the air. I watched yeah. it. I, someone had it as a gift, so I watched it on a loop and it was dying. <laughs> <laughs> so then Jay Lethal hit both FTR with a lethal, a double lethal injection, and everybody was down. So the fans could chant, fuck you, Karen. And then Jeff held Dax, and Jay's got the belt, but Dax fought out. But Jeff hit Dax with the belt and then hit the stroke on him. And Mark now, by this time, Briscoe is up for a two count. Now people are in it. Because say what you want, but it's fucking wrestling. It works when you have up and down and bang, bang, bang at the finish. Not all through the goddamn match and then end the thing with a fucking small package. You're supposed to build to the finish. And then Jeff bullies Mark Briscoe, and Mark slaps a taste out of his mouth, and FTR hits their finish. Boom, one, two, three. And it was it was it was busy, but it was the only thing that was going to get a reaction out of this crowd. After the first two matches, which they, especially the second one, they didn't react to at all. And this is a blah issue. And they know they're going to be sitting there a lot longer. So otherwise, what do you think? I thought it was a blah match. I mean, it was only so much you could do with that crowd. They're going to kill anything, it seemed like. But it was almost like two different, I don't know, Dax and Cash work one way, and Jeff and whatever this fucking dirtbag Cody-verse he has at fucking ringside is. It just ruins everything. I don't want to see Sanjay anymore. And Karen, this felt like TNA. That's the problem. And it wasn't even just Jeff, just everything happening. And the fucking giant who does nothing. He just stands there. He's a ring post. And oh, when they kicked him out, he was do doing the thing to the referee like, I didn't do oh, anything. Hey, like I'm, he was a, a, a pleading giant. I'm a pleading friend. giant in a nice powder blue suit or whatever. So no, I, I, I want FTR to move on to something better. I don't know what it is right now. Well, I was about to, let me just ask you that. Who are they going to have a better tag team match with right now in this company than Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal? Whether that's a, for good or bad. Who's going to be better opponents right now? I don't know. There you go. And I also want them to get away from this whole fucking childish thing where, you know, they're fighting over who's going to be friends with Mark Briscoe and he doesn't watch the show, so he doesn't know why Dax Pyle drove him. And just get They don't get cable in Sandy Fork. Yeah, they do. Uh, but get rid of all this crap. I do want to ask you one question, if you don't mind. If you are working in front of a crowd that's not reacting to anything, what should you do? Should you try to change things up to try to get a reaction out of them? Should you just sometimes chalk it up to there's nothing that could be done to get the crowd going? Is there always something that could be done to change things up and get the crowd going? What do you do if you're in that situation? Well, uh, there's no rule of thumb because every situation is different. It depends on the spot you are on the card, who you're working with, what the issue is or may not be, what the what the issue is may or may not be with the crowd as far as why they're not liking it. Do they just not like you? Or do they... We we I've had everything happen. I've had where they just didn't give a fuck to see anybody. And there's not a lot you can do, but you don't go out of your mind and pull out fucking switchblades and chainsaws. We've had uh, the situations with the Midnight Express and the Dynamic Dudes where they just hated them so bad, even they were the baby faces, it turns the reaction. But you still, you're getting some reaction. Uh, remember I've talked about that time that we had the bunkhouse stampede in Nassau Coliseum, and it wasn't a, an active crowd. They didn't really know anybody. It wasn't a good card. Remember I've talked about how 
with the exception of the war games, the rest of the card was the shits. It was the time they fucked the uh, the time up on the advertising, so people came in like hours late. Oh my um, god! It was just it was it was a mess, and there wasn't anything. You know, there was uh, Bobby Eaton and Nikita Koloff trying to have a fucking match, but yeah, sometimes it just ain't gonna happen. Sometimes. In the territory days or in the days when you you weren't on pay-per-view with a specific time to hit or live television or whatever, you could determine some towns, they didn't want to see the baby face shine. Harlan, Kentucky was like that. Rock and Roll Express could be just kicking ass whoever they were against and just doing all their shit and anywhere else the people would be going, yay, and the people in Harlan, eh. but as soon as the fucking heels would cut them off, and start getting the heat, then the people would get into the match. They weren't happy to see it. They were yelling and cussing at the heels. And that's what, if, if, there were certain towns that wanted to, to be mad. They didn't react as much to the baby face shine, but once you cut them off and start getting heat, that's where they got into it. They didn't know they wanted to be mad, but they responded to the heat. So you stretched the heat out. And then a big comeback at the end, they would blow for the fucking baby face. And other places, they they might not like a wrestling match, so you have to get a little wilder to fucking get them into it. Or, you know, whatever, but there's no, there's no, there's no way to tell anybody, here's what you can do in any situation. I mean, you know, because then you might not be allowed... <sighs> In this fucking environment, in AEW, I guess everybody's allowed to do everything. But in normal wrestling businesses, you wouldn't have been allowed to just say, okay, well, I ain't buying this, so let me get some color, and we'll go out and fucking throw the tables around. If you're in the third match, so there, there's always, you know, sometimes guys wouldn't get a reaction. They were green. They were concentrating on their match. They wouldn't remember to bring the people into it. They wouldn't look at them or gesture to them or acknowledge their their you know response whether good or bad positive or negative they just be boring in doing their match and that especially if they're not familiar with you that ain't going to help so the veterans would always say bring the people in it if you can't get the goddamn whole crowd up find the old woman with the big ass or the fucking ridiculously old looking man with a cane and he looks so frail but he'll shake it at you at ringside or some woman with a fucking weird haircut or anything and start picking on them and if you can get them then the other people get involved in it but you can't do that on television and you can't, and none of that would work if you goddamn were on a show where everybody was just running people down with goddamn Zambonis, then how do you stand out? If the crowd is that quiet, does it help or hurt to have the house lights that bright? Uh, it definitely hurts because people are more, I mean, they make noise in all environments and they're used to the lights being up these days. So they're still going to cheer, but you've always noted, noticed in the territory days when you went to different buildings with different lighting setups because they were, they, back then they were whatever lights the arena had. It wasn't like your traveling fucking wrestling setup. If the building was lit up, they were less likely to throw shit, to cuss, to flip you off, to fucking get rowdy the darker it was, the more like they felt they were part of the the crowd, but they wouldn't be seen or they wouldn't stand out. They were more comfortable. The spotlight wasn't on them. And that was up to and including, if you were in a dark building, you had a better chance of getting jumped on the way back from the ring because they thought they could get away with it. It was in the dark. It wasn't, everybody wasn't seeing them. And sometimes buildings would make that adjustment when they had a lot of trouble with fans jumping in the ring or guys getting stabbed or whatever the fuck, they would bring the house lights up sometime for the main events or the more important matches. Or like in Knoxville at Civic Coliseum, since they had really concentrated ring lights at the Coliseum that, you know, were part of the Coliseum lighting thing, they just hung over the ring, but you couldn't see Dick outside. They would, used to, they'd, and we had them do this. When guys would just fight outside 
around ringside, they would turn the house lights on. So that way everybody in the building could see them, but also we'd make sure they kept them up for the entrances and exits so that nobody could take a fucking poke at you in the dark and then run off. Well, they didn't have to worry about that here at this pay-per-view. No, they did. They had to worry about them running off. If they'd have opened the fucking arena doors, I bet you they would have lost part of the crowd by now. Is this what happens when you give away tickets with cheeseburgers? I think they the people were actually, the cheeseburgers might have set better on their stomachs than this show. I think this, the, <laughs> they were getting sour belches from this. Pro- All right. In the back, Jen and Juice jumped Ricky Starks and beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> but he's been listening to our criticism because Starks didn't go down. He just crouched over and let these two guys just beat on him, but he never actually, I don't think, went down. And then FTR was coming back from the ring, and they happened to happen by and saved him. Hey, you want to talk about a team to put in there with FTR? There you go. Let's see what they could do. Juice Robinson and Jay White. Jen and Juice and FTR. They, but they're going to be beating up Ricky Starks for the next fucking 10 years. And that's where then Jericho and Soraya cut the promo in the back about a mixed tag team match. And that wasn't bad enough because then Jericho starts throwing a fake temper tantrum and picking up stuff off a table sitting next to him and throwing it down. And Brad, you can tell it's set there specifically for him to throw. And then some fucking guy with this building shirt security a building employee comes in and says sir you're gonna have to calm down and jericho throws a fireball in his face and you know i'm a wizard bitch so i just talked about and laughed about that they get they shot an angle on a pay-per-view to come back with a more attractive match on free television for the first time in wrestling history and at the same time, now they're just wasting angles on civilians. <laughs> who gives a shit whether he sets this guy on fire or not? Nobody even knows who he is. And the thing, again, I got almost a dozen legitimate death threats for throwing a fireball in Ronnie Garvin's face. And nobody by the end of this show remembered that fucking, you know, Arnold Finster even got a fireball in the face. What? It's just so he can fucking use his flash paper. And this is the guy giving young wrestlers advice. That's the problem. <laughs> there are too many young wrestlers who think of a veteran stops and talks to them and tells them something to do that it's right. But Chris Jericho shows time after time after time, and with the results to prove it, that his ideas are terrible and they never help anybody and at this point, they reek. You want to talk about something that reeks of desperation? His stuff. All of a sudden, he needs to throw a fireball at some idiot in the back? It's a waste. It's just, it's, it's a waste. It's just a waste. And, I mean, he should have said before he threw it, he should have said, hey, Derek. Yeah. See, that would have gotten a pop. That would have gotten a pop. At least, at least our audience would have reacted. Because theirs didn't. All right. Next was a ladder match. For the TNT title, of course, everybody knows ladder matches are no disqualification. Anything goes. It's Wardlow versus Christian Cage with Dino Douche in his corner. And again, what 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 can I say? Christian is a pro. This could have been such a learning experience for Wardlow to have a match, a wrestling match with Christian. He could have learned some timing. He could have learned how to as it be a, 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 a baby face that's both aggressive toward the heel when he needs to be, but at the same time, he could have learned how to sell as a bigger guy with the heel using subtle tricks to make him sell. Things and such of that. Or they could have gone out here and had this ridiculous car wreck that, again, I had to fast forward major fucking segments of to be able to stomach. Because... Wardlow spent a while setting up two tables on the floor in the entranceway side by side, which of course can help him in no way whatsoever win this match. And then they left him sitting there for a while because, you know, they'll come back to it later. Um, there were ladders everywhere. There was nobody in the ring. 
They were bridging the apron to the railing with the ladder so they could walk on it. I fast-forwarded some. And then Wardlow did a swanton off the top so that Christian could move and Wardlow could hit the ladder. And then Arn came to ringside. Now, Arn, if he's been with Wardlow, why did he just show up halfway through? Did he not expect any of this was going to happen? And the dinosaur, right? And the dinosaur. So anyway, Arn came to ringside. And it, Wardlow selling with the swanton hitting the ladder. So Arn comes to ringside and whispers to Wardlow while Christian is climbing the ladder in the ring. But instead of going in to stop Christian from climbing the ladder, Wardlow climbs to the top rope and jumps from the top rope to the other side of the ladder, I guess theoretically, in a perfect world, it was going to be the old deal where Wardlow just suddenly appears standing on the ladder opposite Christian, so they're looking face-to-face, -face, right? I've seen that spot done before, but not by a 275-pound man, because when he jumped to the ladder, it broke its fucking leg, and the ladder and both of the wrestlers fell, and down came baby, cradle and all. Everybody just hit the fucking deck. So now, Christian had rolled out to the floor, and Wardlow takes the ladder with the broken leg and starts setting it back up to climb the thing. And the corpse referee, of course, Captain Phony, he was the first one to run. They were going to run in and hold it like they did the last time we saw footage of them holding a goddamn ladder with a broken leg while the announcers were screaming, get another ladder! Dude, don't climb that ladder! <laughs> Apparently he heard them, or the one of the referees gave him the Iggy, because he then pushed aside the ladder with the broken leg and got one of the other ten ladders sitting around ringside. But when he gets that one, Dino comes in and grabs... Wardlow and choke slams him twice. So now here comes Arn into the ring. In I know he's had a bad neck and had to end his career because of a neck injury. Does, does he have things going on with his knees that we are not aware of, or was that was he trying to crouch and sneak? I think or so. Why was he unsteady on his feet? I think you got it right. But nevertheless, he ran at Dino, and Dino reached out and grabbed Arn by the goozle pipe, as they say. So Arn, instead of kicking him in the nuts and DDTing him or something that might have got a pop from the people that Arn Anderson would do, Arn got the hand that was around his neck from Dino and bit Dino's thumb, bit down on it, and bit it for a, a little while until it looked like the people couldn't really figure out what was going on. It was kind of like, it's kind of like it looked like a, when a guy grabs one of the marks that's jumped in the ring and there's a tug over the t-shirt or whatever. And then Dino shoved trip, uh, shoved uh, Arn down, I will say down in the Ox Baker description of taking a bump down and turns around to the camera, and his thumb is covered in what I assume is phony blood. Like Arn bit his fucking thumb off. So now, because of that, Dino goes down to the floor and grabs Arn, but Wardlow hits Dino with a chair and a second time and puts him on the tables that he had set up 15 minutes earlier. And Dino laid there motionless with his hands at his sides, not moving a muscle on a table. I forgot to time it because I was going to go get my watch with my second hand. I could have timed it with a calendar or a sundial, but it had to be 45 seconds, right? While Wardlow set up the big old ladder, 
The match, by the way, is still going on. There's a match between <laughs> Wardlow and Christian Cage for one of these belts that everybody has, but we've completely taken a side. We've gone down a side road. They flipped the switch on the railroad tracks, and we've gone to Hooterville. And all of the referees now hold the ladder on the floor for Wardlow while he climbs to the top of it to swanton Dino through one of the two tables. He put the second table up to absorb some of his fall, but it looked like it should have broken his tailbone when he landed. And I, I said, I, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Shortly thereafter, somehow Wardlow won. And I again felt bad that Arn at this stage of his life is having to be involved in things like this. And there you go. What'd you think? As I said earlier, the saddest pay-per-view of all time. I mean, you got the nice moment of Wardlow doing the uh, swanton off the ladder, landing right on his fucking hip and his ass. That's going to hurt. I hate that ladder matches are now just run of the mill, but they are. And I know he's a big guy in a ladder match, but it was a bunch of crap on a show with a bunch of crap. We're, we're trying to figure out a way to make this show entertaining. We're trying to get, we would love to come up with some positive to say just to change the pace. And I'm not a fan of Arn Anderson's managerial run in AEW at all. Whether it's Cody, whether it's his son, whether it's Wardlow, maybe I'm forgetting someone else, I don't know. It's the finger gun that he pulls out of a jacket that he's not wearing. It's everything. And I don't know, not, uh, this wasn't for me. Well, speaking of things that are not for you, <laughs> so the women's, one of the women's titles now was on display or on at stake with Tony Storm and Jamie Hayter. Jamie Hayter, of course, the incumbent champion, and now she's, I'm t they, all the girls switched sides and changed squads. They had an intramural thing going on where they just went back and forth. It was like the old shell game a few months ago. You were like, baby face, baby face. Which one's got the baby face? I can't remember. But Baker and Hayter, who were the heels with Reba, who was the best part of that, and she's gone now, now are the baby faces. And... Storm, Soraya, and Ruby Soso, who were the baby faces that were going to change the game in AEW women's wrestling, have become the heels that everybody hates. And at one time, it would have been a pay per view match if they'd have turned Hater Babyface on Baker. But that window slammed shut on everybody's fingertips. That was the feud that they could have had. That could have been a multi month thing. Hater. With Reba still there, because they were still, uh, yes. Britt would still be a heel, so Reba would still be there. Of Hater getting the Brit, that could have been a big thing. They just blew that. Well, instead, we have a bunch of small things. And this match was further hampered by, I guess, Jamie Hater is injured. You know, I can't understand why there's such a high injury rate in a, in a promotion like this that puts such a premium on good old pa old fashioned pure scientific wrestling. Uh, but Hater's injured, so they did a quick match to get the belt off of her here, which was basically Soraya and Soso -So attacking her before the match, injuring her arm, rolling her in the ring, <laughs> the referee getting the okay if she wants to go, ringing the bell. What the fuck, Kim? God damn it. You've just been in a fucking car wreck on the way to the goddamn arena where you're supposed to engage in a in a three-round middleweight fight against the UFC champion, and you come in and the goddamn your arm is limp at your side, you're bleeding from the head, and you're dragging your fucking foot that's turned halfway around backwards, and the referee says, you okay to go? They rang the bell, and Storm won in four minutes. So now who knows how long Jamie Hayter will be out of action because somebody else is hurt because they keep landing on each other. I watched the media scrum, Tony Storm, I have to say, by herself without Ruby and Soraya. I thought she was great as a heel, just talking to whatever that wrestling media, that there's some real journalists there, I'm not going to lie, there's some people that ask 
reasonable questions. But then there's people that are just complimenting the wrestlers and they want to talk about stupid things and just put over the wrestlers so the wrestlers will smile at them. But she was great in there. And it made me realize just how much they're wasting a heel Tony Storm with Ruby and Soraya. She should be on her own. She was great. She was great. I thought she was great in that media scrum. Yeah, well, remember when she was in NXT at one point and we said, boy, she looks great and she can work. And she still does look good and she still can work, but she's got nobody to work with and she's in the middle of blech. So it's like she's just kind of in that group of people. Speaking of the House of Blech, for the six-man tag team title, the House of Blech defended against the Acclaimed and Billy Gunn. And remember when the Acclaimed were the biggest baby faces in AEW? And the people still like them, no doubt about it, but what now they do jobs in matches that they really don't even need to be in. And this wasn't even booked ahead of time, advertised. It was the House of Blech challenge that was just, except, oh, the, when the people found out when the music played. Oh, it's the acclaimed, yay! And Caster did a disco single-length rap that was, probably, that was the best part of this whole segment and in, in which he wondered why there are no black guys in the House of Black and mentioned that... <laughs> Poor Buddy Matthews. Can you imagine being in a goddamn supposedly evil, mystical, mysterious, gothic, whatever the fuck, spiritual group like this, and and your your name is Buddy Matthews? Get, think about this. If it, in the in the old Hollywood days, if it had been, and who plays the Frankenstein monster? Boris Karloff. Who plays Dracula? Bella Lugosi. Who plays the mummy? Buddy Matthews. The fuck? So anyway, uh, he made fun of Buddy and, and, and Dominic and, and uh, Rhea being a couple over on the other channel. But once that... Um, oh, and apparently the acclaim said, uh, keep your dealer's choice rules. So they didn't even want to pick any of the rules in this match. They should have picked the rule. It'd be a wrap-off. You think any of the House of Black can rap? Do I think any of them could rap? Uh, no. Based on who's in it, no. See there, if they if the acclaimed had said, well, the dealer's choice rule is we want a rap off match, well, they'd have been caught unawares and they'd have lost their title. I did think it was funny during Max Castro's rap that he accused one of the House of Black of being an kind of blackface and then later on we literally saw someone in blackface well yeah don't 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 spoil it (laughs) don't spoil it because there's yes folks there's more (laughs) god damn it how and nobody i told a fucking 30 year old evil knievel joke and the fucking Internet fans lost their mind and they actually had a guy doing Al Jolson with the original paint and nobody said a word. All right, we'll get to that later on. <laughs> so anyway, in this six-man tag team match, Harley needed belly rubs, and I ran out of Sprite, and I forgot to hit pause on my way out of the room, and when I came back in, it was pretty much over with. But at least they had stayed mostly in the ring for this one because the floor is so dark with the lighting effect that you couldn't really see. But Billy Gunn made the comeback, it, and then he hit his famouser on the fat guy with the panda face. He's he was wearing the white face, and that what is his name? I keep wanting to say it's not Brody Lee, it's Brody King. Brody King, Brody King. He ain't Bruiser Brody. He delayed bumped for the famouser. So everybody think about this. Billy bends the guy over and he jumps up and puts his leg behind the guy's head and drives the guy face first down to the canvas for the famouser, right? Did I explain that where everybody's got the picture on it? I think so. Okay, well, this fucking yahoo. Billy goes up, puts the leg behind and drops down. Old Brody fucking 
Bruiser decides to do a headstand. He didn't go flat of his face and his stomach down. He did a fucking headstand, a delayed headstand. So Billy had already landed, and this guy's head was still like a foot or two off the mat. And then as Billy landed, because he's going down sideways, so he lands and he turns over on his kind of, you know, on his side, and this fucking guy rolled over from the headstand and landed on him. And I thought, I'm thinking, Billy's thinking, I get a kick out of Billy Gunn. Oh, he's got a great personality. But I'm thinking, he's thinking, what the fuck? I've been doing this for 30 years. Who landed on my back? Nobody's ever landed on my back. It's, I've never seen anybody take that like that before. So by the time that Billy landed and rolled over his stomach, the guy was on his fucking back <laughs> and rolled right over him. That shouldn't be possible <laughs> from that move. Not physically or mathematically or gravitationally. <sighs> and then Malachi Black hit Billy with the kick, one, two, three. And this thing got 15 minutes, bell to bell observations i mean you hit the high points i missed a lot of this match because after the previous action on the show i needed a few moments to go outside and adjust my attitude so i needed a couple that. minutes to scratch my nuts i would have taken any excuse so all right for another one of the women's titles and if you don't if you say no jim you're incorrect it's the tbs title well, I say to you, yes. And it's also another one of the women's titles. Because how are they ever going to have a male champion? They're not. Then it's a one of the, another one of the women's <laughs> titles. Yeah, okay. Think about it. You can't, it is, you can't ever have a male champion. It doesn't say women's champion, but since they don't do intergender matches then there's never there can never be a male champion unless you have some kind of like i don't know tweener fucking gender is there some mutually agreeable person or gender or entity that can fight both men and women to where it could be a transition but like the old WWF heel champion transition somebody wins it from bruno and 9 days later loses it to pedro We'll have to get into that. But meanwhile, it's Taya Valkyrie in a rematch against Jane Cargill. And I was willing to give this a chance because I wanted to see basically if it was better, if it could be better than the first one. But after the first one minute, I was already saying no. But now the, the entrance, in this case, instead of ha Jane having dancers and the female rapper who performed her way to the ring, Jane actually got into the dance routine herself. She was doing the, the dance routine there right along with him. Maybe we found out what profession she's really suited for. Well, I don't know about that, but it does make you wonder, are there any ideas Tony Khan will say no to? No. <laughs> Is she now the baby Wait a minute. Yes, there are some ideas that Tony Khan will say no to. Uh, fire your fucking goofy cosplayers and get some real talent? No. Let somebody else write this shit? No. He'll say no to a lot of those things. Well, she danced to the ring like no heel I've ever seen before. <laughs> and, and again, the heels are all presented as allegedly in their universe, is either being cooler or nicer or more talented or tougher than the fucking putz baby faces. So anyway, Taya Valkyrie dove off the top and blistered Mark Sterling and turned her back on Jane, and Jane stopped her, and then they went back and forth, and they got some heat, and then she made a comeback. And Taya hit her finish, two count. Jane kicked out a little bit late. Refereed it and stopped anyway. And then Jane just got up from that finish that she was... They're all using Beth Phoenix's glam slam, right? So Taya gives Jane hers. Boom, one, two, kick out, even though it was late. And then seconds later, Jane just kicked 
Taya and picked her up and give her the fucking finish. How? And she got the three count. And so there you have it. And boom. Now Jane was 60 and O. And of course, Mark Sterling can't leave well enough alone. So he gets on the microphone and says, she's a champion that's going to defend anytime, any place, anywhere, but there's no one left to challenge her. Awkward pause, awkward pause. Somebody get on the fucking IFB and tell the audio guy, play music! And music played. <laughs> and out comes Chris Statlander, and she looked good. I don't think she's from Andromeda anymore. She doesn't have her face painted up like an alien pixie. She's got size. We were interested in her work. About a year and a half ago, as we talk about, she seemed to be getting better because she's pretty, we called her Chris Flatlinder about four years ago, but she was getting better. And then she blew one ACL and then another one. So she's been gone for intensive purposes for a year and a half. I'm sure she'll be rusty, but my God, in this field, a some kind of believable woman and the people woke up. And as soon as she hits the ring, they ring the bell. And boom, here we go. Little fight. The Statlander with a tombstone. One, two, three. Big pop. Because at least now they got some payoff out of this 60 and 0. I guess it had to they had to get to 60. Tony decided it's got to be 60 and 0 back at like 34 or whatever. It could have been 56 or it could have been whatever, but at least we got some payoff out of Jane basically just being fed opponents for three years with no programs or angles in as Brian, as you've said, a separate women's division. Well, now, but now is Statlander going to work with all of the girls or is she just going to fight with Jane and Taya? We shall but anyway. see. Would you have done it like this if you were going to get the belt off Jade and again Jade's been presented well on TV Jade has actually popped a number on TV would you do a surprise loss of the title in after what was a clear angle setup post match thing with Mark Sterling it was ridiculous or would you have built up to something knowing that fans would think there's a likelihood that Statlander could beat Jade I would have done either one of those, but I wouldn't have done it on fucking pay-per-view. I would have done it on television where everybody would see it. They sell 150,000 pay-per-views if they're lucky. They get 850,000 people watching the show on Wednesday night. Why wouldn't you do that on TV? Because it wasn't advertised. It's not false advertising. You're not changing anything. Have Jane beat anybody. And then here comes, same thing, and here comes Statlander. Then the whole world gets to see it instead of these poor beleaguered pay-per-view fans. Yeah, Statlander comes out there, one of the commentators yells like, where did she come from? And I'm like, yeah, with her gear on and her music queued up. Where did she come from? <laughs> well, her music was almost queued up. Almost. All right, well, it's time for the double main events of the evening after we've already seen a, a, almost three hours on the pay-per-view, and from what you said, apparently another hour of shenanigans beforehand, of all this chaos, now the main events come up where you're supposed to see all the chaos. But don't worry, there's plenty more chaos. The four-way for the AEW world title was Sammy and Darby and Jungle Jackoff and MJF. And I thought the entrances did show everyone's personality, didn't they? Jungle Boy moped down the ramp like he didn't give a shit. I mean, seriously, he could be arrested for mopery in Memphis. Um, it just He just wandered into the goddamn ring and waved. And then Sammy and his girl Ty Mello Conti come out and announce in the entrance of their match that with their poster boards that she's pregnant. Who gives a shit? She's the one <laughs> that turned him heel in the first place because she has that incredible heat-getting bitch face. 
And now they're supposed to be a happy couple having a blessed event. He's supposed to be a, she'll turn him heel again in two weeks. If she hangs around him, people need to forget she's around. If he's going to be a baby face. Well, they'll have nine months to forget about it now. Well, hopefully, unless he keeps reminding us on the poster board. And then the Darby video. It comes up on a screen. They're in a Vegas wedding chapel with an Elvis impersonating preacher. And a guy in an MJF mask is going to get married. But where's the bride? Well, here comes Darby. Did I say Darby or Darby? You said Darby. Darby. Here comes Darby Allen. (laughs) And I was thinking of Elvis. Elvis and Darby. And he beats up the guy in the MJF mask and then tells Elvis that he's got to help him dispose of the body. And off they drag the body. And then Darby makes his entrance in the arena. And I wrote at this point, I don't want to see this match anymore after this. It just, it's fucking silliness and stupidity and childishness and lackadaisical not give a fuckery amongst the three people they're supposed to be going for the world title. And then MJF's entrance was a an extended instrumental music cut of his, his music with the somber, I don't know what all those in- instruments are. You've got a background in music. Are they <laughs> oboes or violins or whatever the fuck they are? <laughs> Fiddles. You have a background of music. Are they oboes or... Are they oboes? Violins? Or <laughs> Maybe it's the mandolins or whatever, but anyway... Perhaps the bassoon. He, the bassoon came in, and he descended on the throne in his outfit and his devil mask, and then down the entranceway with women in costumes and devil masks bowing and reaching for him like Dracula's daughters. That was cool! At least somebody looks halfway serious about putting on a Vegas show. It didn't make him look like a fucking nerd. It didn't make him look like an idiot or like he didn't give a shit. It made him look like he wants everybody thinking that he's the fucking king shit, which you should because he's the fucking heel. And so it was kind of cool and vegas and the other three were goofy and or boring. And This was the match where I said the analogy I had at the top of the review here. This looked like a 90s indie, maybe a Dennis Coraluzzo show when an ex WWF star that everybody knew who the fuck he was and he was in shape and he had professional gear and he had a tan and he knew how to carry himself. He would work a local show with three indie guys who would look and work like indie guys. And that's what this looked like. And they've got three baby faces and one heel, but the fans are cheering the heel because the people like MJF because at least he's over. And if they'd have got the other two out of the way and didn't have to clutter this thing up, Darby would was also did a wonderful fucking job and would have been over as well. But basically, the whole thing was MJF laying out, at least at the start, while the other three would flip and tumble and roll and do their gymnastics, and then MJF would come in and do one thing and bring the house down. And by the way, they all they they had dropped confetti, which was already ready to go when Statlander beat Jane. So they've still left it laying around on the ring. These guys are doing all those dives with all that fucking confetti out there. It's like... Goddamn, why don't they throw marbles out there too? Make it really dangerous. So, as I said, Larry Moe and Curly would do a half a dozen dives, and every once in a while, MJF would get in and start to make it interesting, but then the other three would continue doing their fucking kids' indie match with all the cool moves and reversals that they've dreamed up, you know, in their basement. But I did, every time that Darby was in there with MJF, it had oomph to it. And you could tell that, again, they're missing, they missed an opportunity. Maybe they can get it back. But Darby and MJF together had oomph to it. And if it had time to develop, they could do something. 
But, uh, you know, again, and that's I noticed uh, Jim Ross was gone. And Tony was there. Where did fucking JR go for the main matches? Uh, anyway, um, Darby and Jungle Jack disappeared, and then MJF offered Sammy money for his baby to lay down and then gave the microphone to Sammy. This is during the match for the world title. And he gave the microphone to Sammy, and Sammy milked it and then said he'd lay down and take the money, and he laid down. And MJF went for the cover, and Sammy Small packaged him for a two count. Again, this is during the match. Uh, <clears throat> they all four got submission holds on each other in the middle of the... This was the first MJF match that I ever remember seeing where I was thinking, how much longer is this going to go? And then everybody gave everybody a Canadian destroyer. And then they did some more big bumps, and Sammy did a Spanish fly on Darby off the top rope onto MJF and Jungle Boy on the floor. <laughs> and I wrote, at least there's no furniture. And I skipped ahead for the first time ever in an MJF match. And all four of them were on their knees trading chops. And then all four of them stood there and fake stagger sold and allowed each other to hit each other. And then I wrote, nothing is happening. And then all three of them gave MJF big moves and then threw him out to the floor and started trying to beat each other up again. And I fast forwarded a couple minutes. MJF got his diamond ring, but Darby hit him with a skateboard in front of the referee because it's no disqualification. And he gave MJF a coffin drop, but Jungle Boy saved MJF. Now Darby and Jungle Boy uh, were wrestling each other, and the other two were gone completely. And I said, fuck this. I went to the finish. Darby Allen went to coffin drop Jungle Boy, but MJF took the title belt and dropped it on top of Jungle Boy, and Darby landed on Jungle Boy and the belt. And then MJF grabbed uh, Darby in a headlock takeover and pinned him one, two, three. Brian, it, it, again, I'm just a poor small town bird lawyer. I didn't do all of the advanced calculus in college on force and dynamics and gravity and things and such of that nature. But with the bumps that Darby Allen that we've seen him take over and over and over again, would it really incapacitate him if he came from 15 feet in the air and landed back first on a belt on top of a human being? Or would it do more damage to the guy that he landed on that was underneath the belt? That's a very good question. But regardless... 30 minutes of this. 30 minutes. I can't add too much. I'm not a fan of multi-man matches. This was four people. If you're into those matches, I could see you liking some of the spots because of the ones you would think they would do, the multiple man submissions and whatever it may be. MJF has to move past this onto something else. After that Jericho match, I'm not dreading the idea it'll be Adam Cole. Certainly to God, it's going to be Darby because he, he fucked him. And the only reason that you would beat Darby in this match is if you were coming back with MJF and Darby in a single. Because otherwise you would have beat Jungle Boy because who gives a fuck? If you're not going to switch the title, beat the guy that's of least use to you. Or you would have at least beat Sammy because you couldn't bring Sammy and MJF back in a single match for the title on pay-per-view or in any kind of big situation. Darby, you can. So I'm holding out hope that we'll see a single match, which will be very good. But this wasn't. I'm sorry, go ahead and finish. With Jungle Boy, I think, again, they should turn him heel. I think now's the time, and people will believe it. And with Sammy, Kim Adam White, his wife's pregnant, despite the fact they were heels. That's what this fan base is. She's pregnant, now they love them. Plus, they were presented as baby faces, just crazy young kids in love, trying to figure out their way around the business on that all-access show. 
So I think you could use that too. You know that Sammy right now is working towards a young family. Someone could try to take him out between now and then, and you got something that people will care about. The only way that I'll care about it is if they do one of those fucking lifeline documentaries on it, lifetime, lifeline, lifeline. whatever. And we find out that, <laughs> that Ty is the one who put a fucking hit out on him. A hit? What? Yeah. Ty arranges with a fucking hit man to put a hit out on fucking Sammy. And and that way she can get the insurance. He takes out a big insurance policy because he's going to have a baby and start this big family, right? And then she finds out about the insurance policy and it takes out a hit on him. And the hit man shows up in the parking lot of a pay-per-view and fucking takes him out. And I'll get interested in that. Well, you really are in a bad mood today. Well, I'm about to get worse because it's time for anarchy in the arena. Otherwise known as assholes in the asylum. Twinkle Toes, the Buckaroos, and Hangnail Page against Plumber Moxley, Claudio, Wheeler Useless, and poor Brian Danielson. Once the greatest wrestler in the world, now forced to hold the chicken while the geek bites its head off in the county fair. And there's nothing worse than being a geek except being the fucking holder for the geek. Can you imagine how low that is to have to hold the chicken while the other guy has the high-paying job of biting its head off? Anyway, so the BBC had a band. I wonder what the music budget is. on. And what about ASCAP and BMI? Are they all in on this? I would assume whatever the publishing company is for a while thing, they're in on this. Are they getting the memo on this? Hopefully this is not a fucking bootleg type of operation, but they had some kind of band play Wild Thing for the BBC, and the lead singer of the band was in blackface. Now, this is after Max Caster brought up blackface. Yes. Earlier in the show. <laughs> and this guy's looking right at the camera. <laughs> The only difference between this guy and Al Jolson was that this guy's lips lipstick was red rather than white. But otherwise, what was the meaning of this? And why, how did this escape anybody's attention that there's a fucking white guy out there in blackface? And everybody's just, just wandering around like he's goddamn normal. And like nobody's saying a goddamn thing about it any place else on any uh, <laughs> anywhere else in this country at any time of day or night in any state in any city in any county in any province if somebody shows up in blackface it makes the network news this guy's out there in fucking blackface and everybody's just oh they're singing along to the song hey tony wants to know where the band is oh we're ready but jerry's putting on his blackface yeah. Maybe you shouldn't go out there tonight, guys. <laughs> Was this a band that is heard of, or is this just Friends of Moxley's? That's actually the name of the band, Blackface. You know, there used to be a southern band called Blackfoot. I do know that. But unfortunately, that was also a southern condition many people would have lived around the periphery of the swamp, so... But no, sir, is, have these people ever been heard of by anybody, or are these friends of Moxley's? Because I would believe anything. I don't know who the band is, to be honest with you, but <clears throat> everyone that I've talked to so far, including you now, has had the same reaction. As soon as this guy was shown on camera, it was, oh my God, he's in blackface. <laughs> and it wasn't like that there was, there, there was a whole motif to their stage presentation that would somehow <laughs> give context or make clear why this motherfucker is out there in fucking blackface. It wasn't like they weren't the Amos and Andy fucking trio or what. So anyway. Max Senate presents Wild Thing. <laughs> the fight started in the stands because the elite went up to meet because they couldn't come out. That's another thing. They got the band on the stage playing their entrance, but they couldn't come by and high five their band because they had to come from the fucking top of the cheap seats. So they get in a fight all up in the stands. 
all eight guys and you can't see anything and the cameras are trying to cut back and forth and the band is still playing. And there's bad indie wrestling, quotation marks, everywhere going on. It's just the wet dream of any outlaw indie mud show wrestler to be on TV and do this shit that they all do. And then there's Claudio, poor Claudio, he has such talent. God damn it. And he's holding the corpse referee at fucking Rick Knox. That desiccated fucking liver looking piece of motherfucker. And he's done a blade job. It was only a pap smear, but still the and they're screwed. The referee is bleeding. And I guarantee you, because he's a Mark, friend of the Buckaroos from, I guess he was the principal when they were in grade school, because he's got to be 60, right? But I guarantee you, he went up to them and said, hey, can I bleed tonight too? It's going to be badass. You remember it, it, was, it was months ago that we were talking about the fact that AEW, to their benefit, to their credit, didn't have ref bumps? And tonight, <laughs> on this show, we saw a ref bleed, we saw another ref take a guitar shot. Mark Briscoe was bumped, a special referee. I don't know what Sabu was, but he left. But uh, anyway, yes. So now the Mark referee is bleeding to fulfill some kind of fetish he's got about being in the wrestling business for real and bleeding and everything. So then Hangnail took his eye patch off that they've been milking. His eye is fine. It was a fucking rib all along. It was, it was a way to sucker him in, think he was half blind. But they didn't use it in any way. He just got in the ring and took the patch off. Okay, I'm fine. And then they had an eight-way in the ring with chairs, and they were somehow, they were doing all of this violent stuff while at the same time, somehow, with their their body language or their actual actions or whatever, showing that they were not really serious about it and it was all fake at the same time. How did they do that? I don't know. It, but you do you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh no, I watched this match. I watched this disaster of a match with the music playing all throughout the early portion of it. I watched this. Well, and then the, the Buckaroos, to their credit, finally stopped the band by super kicking the singer. I will say though, one of the highlights of the match for me, because they do wild thing once, and you're like, okay, they're gonna do it while the fight happens. Then they go into it the second time, and it's still going and. I don't remember Wild Thing being that long, but then there's a little bit of a pause, and then they go into it for the third time, and yeah. you almost hear the crowd react like, oh, like they were even happy that this is going to continue because it's so ridiculous now. And again, I think at one point the, the band <laughs> just said, fuck it, start no we're just going to Wild Thing, you make my heart say Wild Thing, you make my heart say Wild Thing, they're like record skipping. But then the band, the su singer got super kicked, and that brought that to an end. And then we noticed the plumber was bleeding. Plumber Moxley's bleeding. I don't know which that I'm more confused about at this point. Why would anyone want to watch this match or why would anyone want to do it? Even if they were going to do a garbage match main event, they didn't protect it. Every other match tonight was the same thing. No rules, do whatever. So I was always taught whatever you're doing, that's disrespectful to the main event. If you do what the main event's going to do in this case, it's everything, but they didn't even protect their own garbage wrestling. They let everybody else step on the main event guys. Even if this is something that deserves to be stepped on like a cockroach. And that again, why, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Is this the fantasy now that guys have? And we used to like to pretend to be big star wrestlers, but we, we didn't pretend to want to be big star wrestlers and fucking dive off ladders and put people through furniture and roll around in barbed wire. And Oh, it'd be cool if we stomped on thumbtacks. That's fucking stupid. How old are they? Fucking eight. When you're 15 years old, you want to work and be like Stone Cold Steve Austin or whoever the top guy was in your territory. And why ever have another show? Ever another wrestling show? What else is left to do? 
Claudio and little Maddie were out in the concession stand. Twinkle Toes and the plumber were taking bumps on a barbed wire wrapped poker chip that was three feet wide. Um, Moxley stabbed Twinkle Toes time after time in the head with a fork, but there was no blood, Jerry. There was no blood. Not from Twinkle Toes. Just from Moxley, who bleeds when people fucking think bad thoughts about him. Tony Schiavone had a brilliant quote. It's hard to follow what's going on, you think? Um, 15 minutes felt like an hour. Paige was bleeding. Nikki was bleeding. Claudio and Maddie were in a parking lot in the bed of a pickup truck. Moxley was licking Nikki's blood, because that's badass. Somebody brought a leaf blower into the ring, but to hit people with, not even to blow in their face. I get because Moxley's a plumber, not a gardener. Um, then they got in the ring and did one thing after another, and then nothing happened. And then suddenly Maddie, who had been out in the pickup truck in the parking lot, comes back down to ringside, and they've gimmicked his boot. So he super kicks Moxley and his boot explodes in pyro. An exploding super kick. How would that have happened in any respect? He was just in the bed of a pickup truck in the parking lot. He stopped on the way back before he could help his friends in this desperate struggle to load his boot. With nitroglycerin? What the fuck? Gunpowder. Children. That they, oh, well, this would be so cool. Wouldn't that be cool? Yes, it'd also be impossible to really happen in any way. What the fuck are you people doing? When he gave the other two super kicks right away afterwards, was the pyro supposed to go off for those two, or was it a one-time thing? Because he just kept super kicking right after he did that first one. Well, I think the other, it was super kicking with the other foot, because I think it was just a one-shot boot. But see, here's the thing. The fucking BBC didn't know that. They didn't know whether or not that his right boot was still loaded, so they took him down and took his boot off and his sock off and dropped him foot first into thumbtacks. And this stupid little fucking weasel legitimately had thumbtacks stuck in his foot. Is barefoot because he's an idiot. How were these people raised? Who convinced them as children that this was wrestling and what they were supposed to imitate if they wanted to be wrestlers? How did their parents fail them that they both wanted to do this as kids and never grew out of it? It's more classy now to aspire to be a trailer park meth maker than a pro wrestler. So then they put tax in Matt's mouth and <laughs> Claudio hit him with an uppercut. And I wrote in letters that looks like they were clipped out of a ransom note, will not end. And finally, Twinkle Toes was about to give useless the one-winged fairy when Don Fallis rolled into the ring. And Kenny turned, and of course, instead of the aha moment where he turns around and points at him and has fire in his eyes, and the heel begs off, and Kenny just turned around and stood there like a fucking mooch. Ah, oh, you. And then, did you see the incredible choreography? I had to play it back four or five times this part. This is why it took me so long to watch this show. I got up early to watch it get through the whole thing, but I had to run so many things back because I couldn't believe them. The choreography between... Don Fallis and our friend take a shit. Did you did you catch it or were you rolling your eyes by that point? I mean, I knew what was happening as it was happening, but what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about... So Don Fallis is standing there in the ring and Kenny Olivier is looking at him and the shit's about to go down. And what's supposed to happen, and I encourage everybody, go back and, and watch this, if you don't believe me, on your DVRs or wherever you keep this pornography in a closet locked up hopefully away from the children take a shit 
is supposed to roll in the ring from the floor and come from behind Don Fallis and hit Kenny with the big running, jumping knee and knock him goofy, right? Well, goddamn, as Don is begging back a little bit from Kenny, he looks over his right shoulder to see if Take is coming. And Take is coming. He's under, coming under the rope at that point. So instead of moving to his left and letting take a shit, stand up, and run and give Kenny this knee, Don moves to his right and gets right in front of take a shit, where take a shit bumps Don coming up, and Don stumbles and falls down and nearly trips take a shit to where take a shit at the last minute saves this thing partially by jumping over Don Callis and hitting Kenny kind of sort of in the upper chest with his fucking knee, and Kenny takes a big-ass bump. Don tripped him. He tripped his own man. He tripped his own man, Jerry. He got in the way and got bumped and then went down and fucking nearly flummoxed it. It would have been if Take a Shit had fallen on his face at Kenny's feet that would have been the funniest thing I've ever seen. As it was, he connected somewhat. Kenny took a big bump. The referee was staring at everything because it's no disqualification. And then Wheeler Useless comes in with a screwdriver and stabs Kenny in the head, no blood there, and pinned him one, two, three. In 30 minutes of this. I couldn't delete it fast enough. I th the WWE needs to watch out. And I'm going to go on record as saying that right now. The WWE needs to watch out if AEW presents any more shows like this. Then the WWE is in trouble. Because you watch another one of these son of a bitches, you don't want to see any wrestling at all, ever. Your thoughts? I thought this was awful. The camera work made it even better. Whenever they flash from one fight scene to another in a different part of the arena, it became funnier and funnier to me. The music doesn't make it more badass. It makes it funny. It's funny. When they go into the second time, it's funny. People laughed when they went into the third time. I think when you look at the problems in AEW, and we've, we've got a lot of feedback. A lot of people thought we were too nice in everything we've said about the success so far with Wembley. I, can't, I was very shocked by the feedback. People thought we should have pointed out that WWF did however many thousand at Wembley when business was dead domestically. That WCW did great in Europe in the early 90s when they couldn't do anything domestically. So it's well, that's, not, that's, all, that's nothing unusual. That's been the case for the past 35 years since Vince started the national or international expansion. They book more international stuff when business is down domestically because they haven't burnt the international markets out. They get very sparing amounts of shows so they can always be depended on. And there's a built up and pent up demand where that does not exist in the United States where they've been over wrestled, especially this kind of wrestling. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think when you look at the problems they're having with ticket sales the problems they're having with not growing their audience, the problems they're now having with dead audiences. Remember the spirit and the energy around AEW four years ago and three years ago. Then the pandemic, people were excited to get AEW back. The TV's been bad. The booking's been really, really bad. There are more and more stories coming out about different wrestlers basically doing whatever program they want to do as long as Tony says okay. So we talk about they're needing booking help. At this point, they just need one person to be the booker. Just one. Not a committee, and then wrestlers get to do what they want anyway. Well, yeah, the, 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 even the TV matches, it looks like they just send them out there and say, okay, go out and have a match. Uh, you win. Got 10 minutes, and just figure it out. But when you look at all the problems they're having right now and how dead everything feels, nothing has any spirit or energy. I don't care how... Happy Tony wants to appear in the media scrum and how great everything they want to say everything is here. 
when you look at the ticket sales and everything else, how do you not blame? How, and I shouldn't even say blame, because again, there's a booker and there's an owner. But the elite and the Blackpool Combat Club, this has been bad. This has been poorly booked. No one's as into it as the wrestlers that are in it. <laughs> perfect. That's a perfect statement. And it's true. And I think AEW really better. They're in a dangerous point right now because I know they have great things happening. They're getting another two hours of TV that they're going to be paid for. They're going to go to Wembley and do $8 million at least and a big crowd that'll look great. But things don't appear like anything is going upwards. There's no upwards mobility domestically right now. Nothing feels hot. There's no one you really yearn to see or go out of your way to see. The people that you felt that way about, they find a way to beat that off you. Or they hide them until you just lose interest. You know, now we're going to have another show with a split roster. <laughs> I have not seen anything that tells me these problems are not going to keep happening. We've been talking about it since the beginning, and people thought we were just haters. And then eventually everyone comes along and sees the way we saw it before they wanted to admit it. And I think you're gonna, you have a big problem in AEW right now. And it's a leadership problem, but it's a motivation. It's a fan motivation, but those fans sat there. There's a Vegas crowd. They sat there like it was New Japan like years ago before there were like lots of spots to pop for. <laughs> no, they sat there like, are they kidding us? Seriously, because they just ran off and left them at the start and there wasn't a way to... Every once in a while, like I said, they had a cool visual or something, but again, people popped more on spots than they did on people, on talent, on wanting somebody to win or to accomplish something. It's just, it, again, it's watching a loop of car wrecks, random car wrecks with people you don't know in cars you've never owned. Does anyone want to see any of these people again? That's, I mean, the whole show, like, no one comes out of this way. Oh, I can't wait to see what they're going to do next. I mean, maybe Statlander? I mean, very few people on this show. And, you know, with this main event, Takeshita turns, as we expected. I heard Danielson during the media scrum, and this is part of the problem. And this is part of the being in the bubble and not being in reality and wanting something more than it should happen. But they were really putting over the idea they gave Wheeler Yuta the win in this match with all these different people that are AEW top stars. Wait a minute, they said at the media scrum, yeah, we let Wheeler win? Well, that's not the way they said it, but Danielson is taking a lot of pride in the fact that Wheeler, opp Wheeler opportunity, Wheeler Yuta got an opportunity like to get that win in that match where more than likely he shouldn't have been the one. And there's nothing other than the fact that Moxley and Danielson want this guy around them. There's nothing that says he's ready for the next level, the next step. Fans aren't yelling for him. His work not. isn't spectacular, but they gave him the win in this match. They elevate the wrong people. They push the wrong people. They let the wrong people have input into their fucking stuff. Just everything there right now is not good. That's a great way to get out of it. All right. Well, that was AEW... Uh... Double or nothing. And at this point, we return to whatever else is on this drive-thru. Tally-ho.